particular topic yesterday. <clears throat> and today we are we are hosting Sebastian Rissi from IT University of Copenhagen. He is a full professor in IT University of Copenhagen and director of the Creative AI Lab and co-director of the Robotics Evolution and Art Lab at IT University of Copenhagen. He is founder of Model AI, which develops AI techniques for game development, a company based in Copenhagen. He did his PhD at um, University of Central Florida and the uh, postdoc at Cornell University. His research interests are making AI approaches robust and adaptive by making lifelong learning machines and using collective intelligence. Today he's going to talk about growing adaptive and self-assembling machines. Thank you for being here, Professor Risi. The stage is yours. Yeah, thank you a lot for the invitation. And um, yeah, if there are any questions in between, definitely can interrupt me. And uh, otherwise, we can take questions also, can do both, take some at the end as well. Um, and yeah, thanks for the introduction. So yeah, I'm going to talk about some of the research we're doing, trying to make machines and, and uh, AIs more, more adaptive, uh, use, incorporating ideas from uh, biological uh, computation like, um, like self-assembly and, and self-organization. And kind of um, our research is going a little bit, I guess, against the trend of, of current AI methods. So the current trend is uh, you want more and more kind of parameters, like every week there's a new um, there's new models released with with more parameters and and this plot is from 22 like so by now uh, the the number of parameters of these neural networks have even gone up uh, many orders of 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 magnitude so chat gpt is is not even is not even on here but it's basically going very fast that uh, and we have seen that there is a lot that these models can do like um, these large language models foundation models and they are very useful for kind of um, many tasks, but still um, not only foundation models, but also like large networks in general have these uh, are quite brittle when confronted with things that they haven't seen during um, training. So, for example, here's an here's an example of uh, a neural network that was at the time, you know, this is a few years ago now, but they, uh, many networks still have the same kind of drawbacks that is very good at detecting uh, an object the way it's uh, seen it during training. So a school bus in a normal school bus orientation, it has no problem. It's detecting it as a school bus, also a motor scooter, no problem, and a fire truck. But if you slightly uh, or sometimes more than slightly or like reorient these um, these objects uh, and if they're in unfamiliar poses, then we can see that suddenly it thinks it's a garbage truck. Uh, it's a punching bag, it's a snow plow, uh, here it becomes a parachute, uh, or uh, suddenly the fire truck becomes a school bus, uh, or a fireboat or a bobsled, if it's in, 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 a, in a position that the network hasn't seen before. Uh, while, like, if you look at um, uh, humans, they would still be able to recognize this. And we also have seen that many times JetGPT uh, is producing, like, a, the correct output, but it can still be fooled. Uh, it can be attacked. It's not very resilient in things that that are that are outside of the distribution of of data. So that's a common kind of threat uh, in current machine learning methods. They're good at uh, if we have the training example, but if it if things deviate enough, they still break. This is one of my favorite examples of. Um, uh, so these these bots were trained or the the. Um, uh, the goalie was trained um, to defend uh, against the, the the soccer player kicking the ball in. And what is interesting that if you train, if you allow the, the goalie to come up with different new adversarial strategies, then it came up with a strategy of just throwing itself on the ground. And that completely confuses the striker. So the striker also completely breaks down. And normally this this would be a, this would be a, a, an agent that sh can shoot the ball into the goal anytime. But if the the goalie comes up with an adversarial strategy, it uh, it completely breaks down. And so of course this would probably not be the best strategy in a real uh, soccer game. But in for our RL agents, they can still exploit basically find examples that make the other agent completely uh, lose it. Um, 
And so our and uh, of our group, the idea and, and also other groups that that following this, these ideas is to incorporate other mechanisms from nature that we have seen um, allows these system to be like incredibly robust, robust uh, and uh, and adaptive, like uh, specifically self organization and kind of this idea of self assembly into our system. So just through the process of self um, uh, as assembly, like uh, we, we, uh, trees grow, brains grow. We have seen that uh, even following simple rules, these ants can make bridges across uh, ob uh, obstacles that are that are longer than than their own bodies. Uh, uh, animals can regenerate uh, limbs after damage. Following simple rules, these termites can then can make these incredible um, uh, large structures. Um, uh, and of course, uh, we also see this adaptivity in in the um, uh, in, in in other animals like the, these dog that lost the leg, and is still able to perform well. Uh, while often our robots, if even only small damages, they cannot perform any anymore. So these ideas of kind of collective intelligence and many kind of maybe even simpler units uh, working together to create robustness is, is some of the ideas that we would like to incorporate in our like deep learning uh deep neural network system to also make them more robust and 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 more uh adaptive and and these are just some of the properties that these uh, systems can do they have fast learning they have resilience um and we also have this kind of distributed coordination between many independent independent parts so this, there's no like single point of failure because all these things work together uh, and also working with these kind of compressed representation that I'll I'll sh I'll, I'll go more into detail. Um, so as I said, the, so the big goal is can we combine these ideas with uh, uh, deep learning in in some way? And so I'll I'll present uh, a few kind of um, different approaches uh, where we try to basically do that, and then pointing towards um, what we aim to do with this in the future. Um, so one thing we 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 looked at is is this what I mentioned that uh, in in the simulated robotics domain um, that these systems often are brittle when you when you for example these robots if I uh, I have a, a normal robot and I have a robot where I cut off one of these legs uh, then what will happen likely is the robot is is working fine if the morphology it has seen. Uh, but then if we add another morphology that it hasn't seen, then it basically completely breaks down. So this robot was trained with evolutionary strategy on one complete morphology, one morphology where one leg was missing and that it, and that it is able to still work with, like the, the one coming up now. Uh, but then we gave it another one that it hasn't seen before, this one. And then it doesn't know kind of what to do anymore. And here on the right side, you see this the the patterns of weights that was learned. Um, and um, I'll show you later an approach where basically this pattern is not static, but changing the whole time. So the the current normal paradigm is in uh, machine learning or reinforcement learning. You train a neural network, you have the weights fixed, uh, and then they don't undergo any more changes during the lifetime of the agent. But uh, that's quite different to in biological systems. You have changes happening all the time. So we were interested in, can that allow these kind of systems to become more resilient? And how we, um, so this is a paper we had a few years ago at, at NeurIPS, where basically what we, um, what we um, uh, decided to do is we completely, the networks are always completely random at the beginning of each episode. So every time the agent is born, we completely randomize all the connections in the network, so completely random. And then the only thing we evolve, we train with artificial evolution is the parameters of what's called this Hebbian learning rule. So basically, uh, this rule is uh, uh, it's, it's also known what fires together, wires together in biological brains. So um, when two neurons often they are activated together, then the connection between them gets stronger. So we wanted to see only allowing agents to to change their weights in this way can it be make them more more robust. So basically, for every connection in this neural network, we evolve these four parameters or five, which is the 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 learning rate, the presynaptic uh, the the um, the correlated activation of uh, um, uh, sorry maybe I should have started with this. So this is the activation of the presynaptic neuron. So of this node. 
And this uh, is the activation of the postsynaptic node. So every time step, we basically change the weight of a specific connection based on the activation of the pre and postsynaptic neuron. And we have these parameters that allow to say, is it more important that they're activated together? Is it more important the presynaptic activation? Or for example, is the postsynaptic activation more important? So, and then there's also this learning rate. So every connection in the network, instead of having one parameter, which is the weight, the weight is random at the start, but we evolve these addition, these other parameters that that uh, that tell us how much should I change at each time step uh, of the simulation. I change the weight of the network. And if I do this, then we can see here. So what you can see here is the weight pattern. So because the weight pattern is changing all the time, it's not static like in traditional neural networks, but each time step, it's actually changing. And it's this initially, it's completely randomized. And you can see that very quickly from random initial network, this system is able to learn to walk. So in only a few time steps based on this meta evolved learning rate, learning rules, it is able to from completely random weights, um, uh, reach some kind of a tractor of the weights where it's able to locomote. And what you can also see when you compare the static network with the heavier network, the heavier network is able to walk also with morphologies it hasn't seen during training. So this one wasn't seen during training. It's still able to, to function, while as the static one, as we've seen before, is not. Uh, and uh, so you can quick, so the weights also interesting, they, they don't reach they're not converging towards like one stable thing, but they're still changing a little bit the whole time while the agent interacts with the environment. Uh, and we didn't only apply this to this robot task, but we also applied it to this uh, um, this task where you have to r r uh, raise a car in a procedurally uh, generated track where we can also see that it's the whole time while the network is, is um is driving the 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 weights are uh, are still uh, changing basically and then so then so basically we have a system where it's um this neural network that is uh, uh, this distributed system where the, the that is based on the idea of kind of self organization where the weights have to self organize in some way so that the agent can reach a high uh, performance and um so in this case, we had the, so one thing we wanted to test, how good is the system at uh, damage, not only to the morphology of the robot, but also basically to kind of brain damage where we actually, we, uh, we have, we take the weights and we, we replace many of the weights in the network with uh, zeros. And then 10 time steps later, just based on this self-organization, they were able actually to uh, create a slightly different weight pattern but still allows the net, the the robot to to uh, to have a, a good performance. So here you can see there's first there's a drop in performance when we zero out the weights, but then a few steps afterwards performance is recovered and the robot is is again able to um, to network. And if there are any questions in the meantime, just to interrupt me. Otherwise, I'll I I continue and we can also uh, do them later. Sebastian, I can ask something. Oh, there was some echo. Can you say again? Yeah, we needed to enter from here. So I, I was going to ask, these weights are like state, right? Like you have a state of a neural network at time step t, and then based on that, you are learning the next state at time t plus one, based on both t and t plus one. Can we consider it like this? Uh, so it's it's a little different that we have basically we're evolving so we have two loops so one is the outer loop which is evolution that determines these these rules for the agent these this rule here for every synapse uh, and these rules are they're just basically because we use evolution initially these rules are all completely random so we have a population of let's say a hundred of of networks that all have different rules we simulate those networks. Some of those networks will reach a better performance uh, in the task, and those learning rules are then selected to be the become the parents of the next generation. So we only evaluate 
the robot the, the robot does not get any feedback during its lifetime it only gets feedback uh, like it doesn't get any feedback about its performance it only gets feedback about the performance at the end of its lifetime so once the simulation is done we say okay this distribution of rules resulted in the fitness of 100 this other distribution of rules resulted in a fitness of 50 uh, so the one that reached 100 we take that as the parent for the next generation slightly mutate those hebbian rules and and try again okay yeah thank you so the only so reward is so this hebbian currently this hebbian network does not take into account reward during the lifetime so it's like uh, it's it's only purely self organized uh, that it arranges these weights based on the incoming activation from like the sensors of the robot but none of these sensors is is the is a reward input basically i see i see um so uh yeah so so but basically there can be situations um when uh uh the the like damage is just too severe to continue functioning so so we can cut off a leg of this robot uh, and it's still able to work but but there might be other types of of damage where it, where it, uh, where it's not possible and and nature also solved this issue uh through uh, morphological regeneration so uh, you can cut off like limbs of a of a salamander and 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 other animals that are uh, have this amazing ability to basically uh, regrow the damaged component over its uh, lifetime uh, and so if we had robots that could do similar things then we could they would be much more resilient and they could do uh, uh, we could send them you know in on on unmanned missions and they can just regrow what was lost and so we we're building on this idea of these kind of cellular automata to create uh, robots that can regrow damaged components again to this kind of process of self-organization. So I guess uh, probably people here know about cell automata. So the idea is to, uh, every cell has a, their rules for when should a cell be alive and when should it be dead. And by having very simple rules, uh, you get these like really interesting kind of patterns emerging. But in a traditional cellular automata, you have a, a, a lookup table that says, okay, if I have three neighbors, I become alive. If I have four neighbors, I become dead. And so the idea is behind these, uh, can we learn these rules instead of having hard-coded rules so that these rules might lead to outcomes that we're interested in? Like, can we learn the rules for a system to show a certain type of pattern or grow a certain type of pattern? And basically for this, we're using this idea of neural cell automata, where basically in each, each cell is not controlled by a, a lookup table, but each cell is controlled by copies of the same neural network and it, it it asks the neural network what to do. So it asks the neural network, if uh, the cell to my left is this type, the cell to my right is this type, should I become, what type of cell should I become? And what it becomes is also learned because the neural network is, is trained. And so we use this approach to basically, we, uh, we start with a single cell here. And again, we have a neural network that is like a distributed system. So you have the copies of the same neural network running in each cell. Like you have the same, you know, the same DNA in, in every cell of the, the, the human uh, body. Uh, and and um, the, the, um, the network then decides, okay, I become this type of cell. And, and depending on my neighbors, they communicate with each other. So they only communicate locally. They decide what I should become. We let the system, initially the system is a random uh, neural network that grows random things that will not perform well. But in this task, we ask it to grow something that is then able to locomote uh, in this kind of growing a soft robot that is able to locomote. So it could decide between different types of material, like uh, some material that have that has a higher stiffness, some material that oscillates in a higher frequency. And then we task it to create something that can locomote. And that is the fitness that we used in this case to evaluate how good is that grown structure. And then we can see here, it was able to grow a structure able to locomote. Uh, so this is after training. So it's able to grow something that is able to uh, um, to walk. Uh, and then we wanted to, and it can do that. It can create very different uh, robot structures. Uh, and, and then we wanted to see how good is it at uh, recovering from damage. So if you don't train the network to recover from damage, of course, it will not, not know what to do. But we trained it not only to be good at 
locomotion, but also how good is it at if I cut off something and let the network run again, how good is it at, at recovering the previous morphology and the previous uh, locomotion abilities? And if we do this here, so encouraging it for both locomotion and regrowth, then it's basically able to, uh, so initially it will not know what to do, it, it will fail, but then it's able, if we, re, if we let it run development again, it's able to regrow these missing components and then it's able to, to locomote again. And, and this one has a slightly lower performance, so it's not because it, uh, there was a slight difference between the initial grown morphology and the one that it was able to grow after, after damage. Um, uh, so it's not perfect yet, but these approaches show kind of a lot of promise in allowing robots to regrow missing pieces and, and, um, and components. Um, so, so then we thought, uh, so would, it would also be interesting to, if you already, so in this case, we ask evolution to come up with the structure of the robot. So it was not a human designer, but evolution came up with, for example, this, uh, this particular, um, this particular design is something that evolution came up with that worked. Uh, but what if you have already a particular structure that you would like uh, for the system to grow. So you would like to do it in a supervised way. So you have a certain 3D structure and now you want to train a system to grow this structure, but only based on the local communication of cells. And this is something we did in, in this work where we basically used uh, Minecraft. We gave the system a lot of human design structure. So we gave it a tree that was made by a human or an apartment building or, uh, um, uh, or a temple. And then we learned through using gradient descent, we learned the how to change the neural network. So in this case, it's kind of like it, it was implemented as a convolutional network. So meaning where the convolution, every cell just gets the, the its surrounding neighbors information and not information from, from other neighbors. So they have to communicate to do their thing. But basically we trained the system through gradient descent through supervised learning to grow a certain structure that was human designed. And, and then we can see here that it was able to do that. So it's able to grow, for example, the tree um, uh, through this process of self-organization. And in this case, the network can output what type of material is the, is it a, is it a, you know, a, a leaf node? Is it a, is it a, a bark? Uh, in this case, uh, we grow, we task it to grow a complex apartment building where you have 80 different types of materials that each cell can be like a normal block or a bookcase or like um, uh, all these things you find basically in, in, in Minecraft. And then we also, of course, wanted to see how is it doing and growing functional machines. So the interesting thing with Minecraft is you can, you can make things um, that are static, but you can also make things that, are, um, that move and interact by incorporating what's called these redstone components. Uh, and, and they interact with each other to, for example, propel this machine forward. So we wanted to see, can it grow something like this as well? And it was able to, to do that. Um, and then the next step was, uh, can we grow something, you know, that we task it to also grow a salamander uh, and it was able to do that as well. So it's able to basically, by activating these components, it's able to locomote. Uh, and then of course, uh, we were again cruel and, and cut the salamander in half. And then we wanted to see, can it regenerate after this damage? And then it was also able to do that, uh, regenerate, and then uh, able to create a structure that is that is functional, uh, functional again. Um, so can I ask something here? Yeah, yeah. You you say supervised by, but it's actually self-supervised, right? Like the input and the output are the same, like in the variation auto encoders. It's like a three D VAE kind of thing, right? Yeah, it is every time that we're basically comparing what it has grown to what it should grow, like how the structure should look at the end. So yeah, you could say it's a little bit self-supervised in the end that we 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 kind of give it the it it looks how close am I to what I'm supposed to grow? Um so so it's I guess the difference to like an autoencoder is that the inputs and outputs are different. So with an, I guess with an autoencoder, the input is the same as the output. You just want to reconstruct it here. The input is is just 
every neural network just gets what its local neighbors see. It doesn't, the neural network doesn't see the whole picture basically, or the whole structure. But uh, but but otherwise, it's there's definitely some relation there. And we also did some work where we combined actually a neural CA with a variational autoencoder, which we call the neural like a variational neural cell automata that can not only grow like one pattern but like multiple different uh, patterns. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and then uh, so so this is just um just briefly wanted to I can I'm happy to take uh, also um, question on this later but but we also wanted to see can we use that system then to also do something in the real world and one thing we thought this could be very useful for, for kind of shape aware material so we're making this currently we're working on this project so it's preliminary results where you basically have these kind of Lego blocks and you can put them together and each block only communicates with the neighbors but they figure out what type uh, what shape am I a part of. And if you do this and assemble different shapes, then it's able to, over time, it takes a little bit of time. So now all the cells think they are an, an airplane. If I would have assembled a different structure, maybe they would all think they are a chair uh, indicated by being uh, showing blue or being a table or a house or a boat or a guitar. So you can only not only use this approach for... Um, uh, growing structures, but you can also use it to to kind of uh, have the robot figure out what shape am I uh, like each element of a modular robot. What element? What uh, shape am I a part of? Um, so, but uh, so basically, coming to the to the kind of the second part is this basically um, this uh, the the ERC project that we currently working on. Um, where we take all of these kind of ideas and what we ultimately interested in growing is not growing um, uh, like Minecraft structures, even though we think that's also pretty fun, but we ultimately interested in taking these ideas and growing artificial neural networks. Like we want to grow artificial neural networks instead of having them hand designed uh, um, uh, uh, um, by, by like uh, human engineers. So we want to learn not only the way they should adapt, but also the way like we did in the heavy work, but we also want to learn the way that we grow a neural network starting from like a single cell, how our brains are, are, are grown through again, self-organization, local interaction. So this is the, the idea behind this uh, Grow AI uh, ERC project that we're working on um, with these uh, with uh, um, these PhDs and, and and postdocs in in my group. So the, the the basic idea is to this neural development, what we call this neural developmental program, is itself a neural network, and that guides the growth of the policy network that is then actually put into the robot or the game playing agent. Uh, and it's growing these structures again based only on information from the neighbors uh, and 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 maybe an additional genome uh, that it can that it can learn to store uh, like meta learn this kind of representation. And then we we don't only want it to learn that it can grow a neural network, but then also that this neural network should be able to adapt. And the whole hope again is that these systems uh, that we're not there yet, but maybe that these systems, will be more adaptive and resilient to things that are out of distribution because that's how nature basically uh, had to solve this uh, idea. Uh, um, and so we hope that they will maybe uh, work in a similar way. So so basically, we're going the opposite way to uh, current state-of-the-art methods, which have a large number of parameters, uh, but maybe the ability to generalize is lower we 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 thinking about having a, a small number of parameters, so we only training this kind of DNA, this this neural developmental program, and that should then be able to create a large network. So the number of of ultimately the parameters of this network might be very large, like our brains. Uh, I mean, at some point maybe in the future, but the parameters we train is only kind of this the DNA, this the smaller compact. Um, representation, also called like a, an, an indirect encoding. Um, and there's some related works uh, that, that do something similar. Maybe people have here heard about hyperneed or hyper networks. Um, but many of these approaches kind of skip this idea of growth. You still have compression, but you're not going through growth. So the, the 
question in our work is, is this kind of idea of growing a network over multiple steps somehow helpful or is it even maybe uh, essential in creating a more general intelligence? And so we presented some initial work on this uh, at this, uh, or we will, um, uh, no, sorry, we presented it last year uh, at this ALIFE conference in 23. Uh, so which we so we call this the neural developmental program. So basically, the, the idea is that we have um, uh, so this is the the policy network that is slowly grown to become more and more complex. And in each node of this network, we have another neural network running that decides uh, should, for example, should we add a node. So every node can basically decide should I add another node. Um, and then there's another network also that then decides, okay, uh, sh how should I change the connection uh, between these uh, between the the pairs of nodes? So we have basically um, we have this growth process that adds nodes uh, guided by a network, and then we have another network that basically decides uh, how should the connection between those two between every pair of connected nodes be changed. Uh, and so we in it, currently we we have approaches that grow a network and they, at the start of an agent's lifetime, and then we put them into the agent. So there's no adaptation during the lifetime, but that's something we're working on right now, combining this with this ideas of heavy and uh, heavy and learning. But basically, what we're growing right now is like kind of networks that are fixed during the lifetime, uh, but that's something that we 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 are changing. Um, so yeah, so basically we start with this initial cell. Each cell has a, a, a certain state, and then the neural network is uh, is taking those states into account and updating the states uh, for each node. Uh, and then the network can decide based on these states, does it want to add more nodes? So it's an additional output of the network. Let's say, do you want to add a node? Um, and then uh, we have another network that decides on uh, based on these uh, pairs of hidden states. Should how should I change this connection between them? And uh, if we then and we call the whole thing all of these things together, this neural developmental program or, or NDP. And um, how we evaluate it, we let the network grow a structure, we put it in the task, and then we get a certain performance, and that's what we use as feedback for our evolutionary algorithm to um, to decide uh, which NDPs should be allowed to produce more offspring or which ones should be allowed to uh, produce less. And if we do that, then we're actually able to, so here we see the initial growth. So we grow and then we put in the environment and we can see that it was able to find a, a structure that is able then to, in simple environments, for example, oops, it's able to find a network that is able to perform well in, in Lunar Lander, so simple uh, simple games, um, a simple control task. We are also able to grow a network. We grow it, and then again, we put it in an environment uh, that is able to control these simpler robots like Half Cheetah. And we're also able to grow a network for a, a, a smaller version of MNIST uh, that then uh, um, uh, performed uh, decently on, on this MNIST task. So we're still quite far from reaching like state of the art performance, but these are kind of initial uh, steps in, in, in that uh, direction. And the goal now is to kind of scale it up to grow more complex structures. So kind of what's next in also this Grow AI project. So we have this neural development program. We want to combine this with also lifetime learning so that the weights would still change while the age interacts. And then we also working on creating levels and, and procedurally designing levels. So we made this, for example, this Mario GPT work that procedurally generates levels based on text. And so the whole idea is that we, we don't want to maybe test in Mario, but we want to also procedurally generate environments, making the environments more and more complex uh, while the agent get more and more complex at solving tasks. So co-evolving environments and the solutions um, is another kind of pillar of this project. Uh, and so to kind of wrap up, um, so we have seen that incorporating some ideas from collective intelligence can make our kind of agents more robust and resilient. Uh, and so a big question is, is, do we need to go through this growth process or can we skip it altogether? Uh, and that's something we hope to, to get some answers for. And, uh, um, and then also the another interesting uh, thing, uh, what we're going to look at later 
how does this environment affect neural development? So does more complex environments, do we get more complex neural circuits that grow or, or not? That's some of the questions we are interested in. And uh, so with that, um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention and um, happy to answer any uh, questions that might have uh, come up. Thank you. Thank you for this amazing talk, Sebastian. This was great. I have a question actually with, about the last part, like this adding nodes and edges, it looks like a little bit generative models on graph neural networks. How, how does it relate to these generative graph neural network approach? Um, yeah, so so there's definitely, it's it's we use basically a graph neural network structure and we also use in the new version of this, we use like this graph attention. So it's quite closely related. I think what the research I know there is they don't necessarily put these graph neural networks then in like embodied robot task or embodied uh, task to uh, that they need to grow a structure that solves that task. So I think they are, they are uh, used maybe for slightly other task as far as I'm aware of, but they, they you could say that this kind of... Um, it is a it is a graph neural network basically that that we are also working with here. Thank you.